Welcome everyone to uh, week four. Um, we're going to have a fun class. We'll do like a really quick review. Um, and then I've got some new content for you. Um, it's just a couple of people have come up and asked me about books. And um, so we are using a book for this class. And it's a great, we're going to cover a lot of different interesting topics throughout the book. Um, but some have asked me, is the church providing the book? So the way we're doing this is I'm kind of pulling out all the key points and giving it to you to make it nice and easy. But uh, if you do want the book, let us know. Um, I think it's $20 on Amazon. We're going to try and get it like, uh, for a little bit cheaper. I think Cindy was saying um, that the, you would pay something. Maybe it's like $15, maybe it's $12, depending on how many you want to order. But it would be at a discount here and free shipping. So if you're interested and want to go that route, just let me know either like after class or shoot me a note, and then we're probably going to put in an order um, this coming week. So again, you do not need the book. You do not. I'm going to give you all of what I think the key points are, but some people like to get into it and read it themselves and mark it up and whatnot, so we can do that as well. So, Good? Um, all right, so a uh, quick review. Uh, last week we talked about gardening and harvesting, and, and this is a lot of just planting seeds and working with people um, and answering spiritual questions. Um, and not all of us get to harvesting. I'll tell you, I very rarely have gotten to harvesting where I'm actually sharing the gospel and someone's accepting Christ. And, but I want to light the lighthouse. Not me, but like I want the lighthouse lit. But a lot of times I'm just over here. And Greg Kokel too. And that's okay. Because I think that God is going to use this in a variety of different ways. Some people are a little bit more just gifted here. This is where they take the conversation. And some people are, this is really where they like to, um, to work with people and help people. The goal, I think we should have very simple goals, is one is just to make sure we're having dialogue. right? And so Greg Kokel in his book, he says, if we just have conversations with people and do a lot of listening, and build a relationship with people, and we plant one seed, done our job. That's it. So just have conversations. We're going to talk more and more about introductory questions to get into this. Listen a lot, chat, friendly, build a relationship, and then plant one seed. And a lot of this class is going to be whatever the topic is, atheism, uh, morality, um, abortion, transgender, like all these different topics, we will give you a kind of a nugget to plant a seed. That's the goal here for this class. So uh, again, I think the important thing is just getting in the garden, gardening and harvesting. Um, we talked about um, that a kind of good summary point is that God is the best explanation for the way things are. And so as an apologist, you can look at the evidence out there, whether it's in the universe, it's under a microscope, it's morality, it's archaeology. There's a lot of evidence that we say clearly points to God. Um, this is what we did last week. We talked a little bit about just the beginning of the universe. Very powerful argument. And simply, we're just saying, has the universe always existed? And if not, and the answer is no, now we know this based on both philosophy and science, what caused it? That's it. That's the simple point that we're making with this argument. Now, there's a lot to this, because if they go one step further and they say, well, how do you know God? We talked about this. The cause is timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and we can argue personal. So there's a little bit more to that, but if you just plant the seed, like, what caused the universe? That's very difficult for an atheist to answer. Very difficult. And they'll probably just lean on, I don't know. But now you've raised the question. It certainly fits better with Christianity than atheism. Um, it also proves miracles. Um, who created God? Again, we talked about the simple point is, why are you assuming that God's created? And you can have some interesting, fun things. So if I say, well, why have you stopped cheating on your taxes? It's kind of a fun way to point out, I'm assuming something in the question. And that's what they're assuming here is that God was, in fact, created. So we talked about that a little bit last week. Um, lastly, we talked about DNA. Uh, DNA is around information and how this points to a, an intelligent source. It makes a lot more sense than it just um, evolved by chance. So we talked a little bit about that, um, how that is a good piece of evidence. And we'll come up with some uh, situations where you might throw those out. Well, what do you think caused the universe? 
Uh, where do you think DNA comes from? You can toss this out to them and kind of raise the question to get them uh, thinking. We're going to have some fun today. I'm going to play atheist. We're going to do role play, and so we'll get the chance you can kind of react and ask me questions or whatnot as we go. Um, I, think, uh, I think Patrick might have sent me a, a question, and, and some of them have about my website. So again, uh, I've put this out there just so you have a source to go to if you just want some quick information. Um, this is, so it's just christianpoints.com is the website. And if you, if you hover over this thing, points, if you hover over this, a, a list of topics will come down here. And you can go to any of these topics and get some quick information. So if you went down and you clicked on beginning of the universe, boom, this page will come up. And again, it's very simple, and I try and include some pictures to have some fun here. So why is God the best explanation? I give you a summary point here. Since the universe had a beginning, something outside the universe must have caused it, and only God fits this description, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, powerful, intelligent, personal. Uh, and then I just, I, if you started to scroll here, you could get more detail if you wanted. So you can start high level and get a little bit more detail. And it's not like a book. I mean, it's just some quick points if you want, if you want to get to that. So don't feel like, man, i got to memorize everything in this class. There's, there's some sources you can go to. Um, all right. I want to go back. Uh, we've been talking about miracles a little bit. In each class, we're kind of nibbling away at this. One week, we talked about all these surveys that have been done where millions and millions of people are claiming a survey. So I know I sent it out last night, but there was an email I sent out to give you all the sources. So if you want to click on those links or see one of the studies, that's there. Um, we talked about a couple specific cases on miracles. We will do more of that as class goes on. We talked about the creation of the universe is a miracle. That was last week. The last piece of evidence here um, is one where somebody might say, well, I don't believe the miracles in the Bible. And again, I would go back to, well, if the beginning of the universe happened, then miracles are possible and everything else is easy. But why I also believe in a lot of the other miracles of the Bible is a concept in history known as the principle of embarrassment where if there's an embarrassing detail that is noted within the account, it's very likely that that account happened. Because the author not, would have not wanted to paint a negative picture if they wanted to put forward um, a message. Does that kind of make sense, that general principle? And historians use this. Gary Habermas was one of my teachers, and he, this is one of the, the things he talked about. He said there's multiple E's we want. We want early testimony. We want eyewitness testimony. We want embarrassing details. And there were a variety of E's. This is one of those. So I like to use the concept of imagine you were at an interview of not just any job, but your absolute dream job. Like this is the one. I really would love to, that's all right, coach the Patriots. Like I want to be the next coach. Um, now, if, if, if that's what he's going for, would he purposely say something embarrassing that was a lie if he still wanted the job and, and it was embarrassing detail? No, he would not. I mean, if he says something that's kind of embarrassing, it's likely that it is true. Correct? You wouldn't just purposely say a lie that's embarrassing yourself and still want the job. Well, if you look at it, and this is interesting, if you look at the way scripture is written, there's a variety of kind of embarrassing details that clearly wouldn't have been put there if this was being fabricated. So I'm just giving you two examples here, and these have to do with miracles. I'm going to read the account very quickly. You tell me where the embarrassing detail is. All right, Matthew 8, 24. Behold, a violent storm developed on the sea, so that the boat was being covered by the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. First off, where's the miracle? Remember, this is the disciples. Jesus has died and risen. The disciples are putting forth this message. They're saying this account happened. Are they going to paint themselves in a negative way if they are fabricating a lie? Probably not. And this happens routinely in Scripture. Now, we typically gloss over this. But this is, you've got you to live in the story, as Pastor Bob says. If I'm going to make up a story 
Am I going to pay myself of little faith? Probably not. Peter's the worst, right? He gets called Satan by Jesus and whatnot. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses in Matthew 28. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. This is extremely powerful because the entire gospel is here. They worshipped him, meaning he's God. They saw him, meaning he's resurrected. I mean, that's the gospel right there. So if you're making this story up, do you add this? Do you add that embarrassing detail that some were doubtful? Probably not. The fact that this is there is, there were probably some that were like, wait a minute, didn't he die? Is this really him? Some were wrestling with this, and you, that's a human thing. So if you look through scripture, there are embarrassing details that I think prove the truth of the passage. Oh, so we had, um, there were, let me make sure I remember them. I think there were four he goes through. There's early, we want early testimony. We want eyewitness testimony. Those are two of the most powerful. Um, and then we want embarrassing details. And then the fourth one is enemy attestation. Meaning if an enemy says it, it very likely happened too, right? So like when we talk about Jesus is dying on the cross, that is written not just by Christians, but non-Christian sources, enemies of Christ. So if you get those four, those are the things that a story is looking for, and man, scripture fits. We've got early, we've got eyewitness, definitely embarrassing, and enemy attestation. So, all right. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus almost chastised him to some degree, like, stop believing, right? I mean, stop, stop disbelieving. Start believing, Thomas. Yeah, that's a good one. And Peter's like, the whole thing, did Jesus really predict his death? Well, if you look at that passage where he predicts his death, what does Peter do right after? He starts uh, saying, Jesus, this, I'm not going to let this happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. You are a hindrance to me. Like, again, Peter's leading the church. You don't make that up if you're fabricating this story, right? Okay. I would have been Thomas. I would have been, wait a minute. I, I, you're all saying this? Have we all been drinking? Like, I, I need to see where those holes are, right? I probably would have been Thomas because I'm wired as a skeptic. Yeah. You know I mean? He gets labeled that, but you're right. He wasn't there. I mean, James might have been the same way, but he got to see it early. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, let me um, do a little video. This is um, Frank Turek. He just has an interesting point on miracles that I think would be fun for us to see. It's just like a minute and a half. Um, can you hit that, Carol, the light, please? Conversation you start to have with somebody who's over here is very different than one who's over here who's not a Christian. They might be Muslim. They might be Jewish. And the seed you plant is going to be different over here than over here, certainly over here, and even here. So there's just a, these starter questions where you're trying to gain some information to know where someone is at. And that's what some of these were. Now, origin has to do with, well, how do you think the universe got started? And anything that's related to cause or effect, you could, you could tie into, how do you think all this got started? Say, wow, that's the start of a football game is a kickoff. How do you think the universe started? That might be a jump. And we'd be like, look, I just want to watch the game. I don't really feel like talking about. Uh, but you were looking for clues as to where you can ask a question. How do you think that all this got started? Identity is you want to ask somebody about who they think people are, who human beings really are. And I think this one is very good if you want to get into the topic of a soul. So. One idea with this is when somebody says, I kind of feel it inside that I should go to this college, or I kind of feel it inside that I should take this job. My question, well, what do you mean by that? When you say, well, how do, what do you mean you feel, do you feel, do you have a soul? Do you, do you believe you have a soul? Now you're asking, you're kind of feeding off what they put out there to ask a question to find out where on the line they are. If they say, Oh, no, we don't have souls. I just meant like my brain or my... Okay, now you know they're probably on the other end of the curve. If they say, yeah, I think we have a soul, now you know you're dealing with something over here. You can say, well, how did you get that soul? Well, I think that that soul is a part of the universe. I'm a part of the universe. Now you know they're probably over here. Oh, well, God, God gave me this soul. God gives all of our souls. 
Now you know you're probably over here. You see how them just throwing something out there, you're asking a question, you're getting some information as to where they are. Morality, this is an easy one. This is one of the best ones because we're constantly surrounded by morality questions, right? Um, these laws that get passed or this given politician or whatnot or this, uh, this horrific tragedy that happens. It's really easy to say, well, yeah, well, um, I, hear, I totally agree with you, yeah. Here's an interesting question. Where do you think morality comes from? Now, again, I'm kind of jumping there. You probably have to do this a little softer. But when you ask the question, where do you think morality comes from, that's going to tell you a lot. Well, I think morality is from people. People decide morality, just like the uh, traffic rules, right? Well, okay, maybe you might be over here. Help me understand that, and we'll, we'll talk more about morality. Oh, I think God is the source of morality. Oh, okay, I, I, you know what? I agree with you. Which, which God do you think gave us morality? Do you see how I'm trying to pull it in and find out where they are? Okay. Um, last one is, what do you think happens when we die? Um... You know, that, that's a great, that will tell you exactly where. Somebody says, we're reincarnated, depending on how good or bad we were. It's karma. It's a bank account of good and bad deeds, whether I come back as something better or worse. Where are they on the line? What is it? Pantheism, pantheism right? They're probably pantheism. Oh, that's it. Once you die, that's it. We just cease to exist. There's no, there's no afterlife. Where am I there? Atheism, right? So you just you you are asking some friendly questions because this is not only is it just building a relationship, you're showing interest, genuine interest in the person. And while you're doing that, you're getting some information. And then we're gonna plant a seed. Okay? Um, all right. Let's do this for um, the rest of the class. We'll have a little bit of fun with this. We're gonna role play. Um, I am gonna be atheist. One of the chapters in the books is around atheists deflecting. Sometimes they will say these things to deflect a little bit. Um, and there are some certain ways to kind of get around the deflection. There's four different ones we're going to talk about. Um, so let's start with this one here. I'm going to say something that some atheists might say, um, especially the antagonist ones, but I'll say it this way, and then whatever comes to mind, just throw it out there. Now remember, questions are better. Questions are better because they, um, you're not on the hot seat. Right? If you just ask a question, you're just looking to dialogue and get their input. If you put a statement out there, then you bear the burden of proof to back it up. Right? So if you use questions, you're not in the hot seat. You're just kind of drawing it out of them. So as we have this dialogue, you might have something you want to say. See if you can form it in the phrase of a question, just like Jeopardy, right? <laughs> just think about that. Um, how would I form that in a question? All right, so if I say this, you know what? You all are Christians. You are just like me. You are just like me. Um, you don't believe, there's like hundreds, there's millions of gods out there that you don't believe in and I don't believe in. Do any of you believe in Zeus? No. Do any of you believe in Apollos? No. I just believe in one less God than you do. So you're really like me. You're an atheist for all those other gods. Okay, but I mean, you don't believe in Zeus, right? Do you believe in Allah? Uh, no. Do you believe in Apollo? How about Thor? No. Okay, so you, there's a lot of gods you don't believe in. You're like me. Because you think they're silly, right? Because I'm the god that those are all false. Okay. And, I, and, and so what I've done is I've taken it one step further, and I've learned that Christianity is false. I've learned the God of the Bible is false. So you'll catch up to me someday, but right now you're, you're just one step behind me. I'm playing obnoxious. I hate playing obnoxious atheists. <laughs> um, what's that? Well, we've... We've learned that they're false, right? They had these dedicated believers who worshiped them, and then over time they got smarter. And, I mean, look, I, I, if you want to believe in God, that's fine. That's your thing. But, but you are an atheist like me when it comes to all the other gods. I've just gone one step further. Good question. Ralph, you all had really good questions. 
Um, I'm a, if I had somebody dealing with that kind of ad, I would have said, you know what, I am happy to have this dialogue. Let me ask you, are you genuinely open to hearing some evidence for God? And if they, depending on the answer, I might just say, you know what, I'm a good listener. I'll listen, but if, are you really open to hearing? Because I've got some great things to share, but if it's going to be, you know, you're not really open, then I don't know that it's worth my sharing with you. Um, so that's, a, again, I want to have a, what's that? Exactly. Right. <laughs> yes. And we're going to show you how to deal with the steamroll. The steamroller is, and I haven't done that one yet, but that's where you just start talking over people and just don't throw your pearls to the to the swine. Or is what Jesus said. I'll leave you the question. You got it. Yes. That's a, it's a great question to ask. If you're sensing somebody just there for a fight, then that might be your gardening question. You might just say, "Are you genuinely open to hearing about this?" which by the way, if it's true, impacts your eternal destination. Notice how I just planted a seed. Are you really open? And look at what's at stake. And that might be the one thing you plant, right? Um, someone else had, Cheryl. You're using questions to kind of draw them out. And trust me, we're going to give you enough things in this class to go back to, like Carol throughout the DNA. There's a few things where you can go back to them on. And there's going to be some where you're like, I don't feel comfortable going down that road, DNA. Like Shelly can, she knows chemistry, she's looked at this one, she can go, there might be morality. Next week we'll talk about the problem of evil, atheists have a hard time explaining this. So there's a few kinds of stones that you can put in their shoe. Let me show you in the book how Greg handles this, and it's very interesting. So, it, you know, again, this is the atheist side. I put this here because, again, we're always using questions. So you're basically, basically an atheist like me. <coughs> what do you mean? Well, you don't believe in Zeus, Apollo, or hundreds of other gods, do you? No, I believe in one god, the god of the Bible, which was said here, right? Um, <clears throat> so here's the way he goes about this, and he says, and now Greg is married, and he says, so do you think I'm a bachelor? Now again, they'd have to know like, a little bit about you, and I'll give you something else in a second, but uh, they know you're married, say, do you think I'm a bachelor? And he says, well, of course not, you're married. And, well, there are billions of women I'm not married to, and a bachelor has only wife, one wife. Right? One less wife than I do. So you're trying to show them how uh, just because I believe in God, but I don't believe in all these, doesn't make me an atheist. Same thing here. I'm married to one woman, not the other three and a half billion on the planet. That doesn't make me a bachelor. I'm still a married person. So this is just kind of interesting way to do it. Now, if you're not married, there's some other ways you can do this. You can say, people with jobs are all unemployed since many companies don't employ them. Like, I work at a credit union, but I must be unemployed because I don't work for every credit union or every company in the, in, the, in the world, right? There's another one. So murderers are basically peaceful since there are billions of people they have not killed, <laughs> right? So what you're trying to do is show them that, you know, just they're taking the exception and making it the rule. The other really big problem with this, this is what I, and I, this is one that's realistically used. We might think this is foolishness, and it is. This is really used by some atheists. Um, what I would tell an atheist is if I didn't believe in the God of the Bible, I would not default to atheism. That's what they're trying to say here is, well, I don't believe in one more God, so if you didn't believe in the Christian God, you'd be like me. No, I'd pick a different God because Theism is a lot more compelling than atheism. But what they're trying to say is if you didn't believe in, in Jesus, you'd be just like me. No. There has to be an uncaused cause, an intelligent creator. So, does that help a little bit with this one? I think you all did great. And again, go where you're comfortable with. Um, it might just be where you started out where, um, hey, you know what? I just want to share with you my experience. Are you open to hearing that? Put that out there. Again, form it as a question. I'd love to share with you my experience, and are you open to hearing that? If they're respectful, they'll say yes. Okay, here's another one. They redefine faith. Faith is blind. Let's go a little further. What do you mean by that? That's a great question. What do you mean by that? Draw it out of them, because then, 
they've said something that's an assertion, they bear the burden of proof to back this up. Some of us sometimes to feel in the hot seat. No, 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 faith is like, wait, well, hold on, let me explain it to you. You're, you're right. They put God it out. Faith is not seeing. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's keep going in here. What do you mean by Well, faith is the word someone uses when they don't have enough evidence for a belief. They kind of throw in this faith thing. Is that really faith? No. Um, it, so it's obvious we have different definitions of faith, but since we're talking about my view, can we use my definition of faith? Okay, you're talking with, you're an atheist, I have faith. You mind if we, as we're talking about my faith, we use my definition? You don't get to redefine faith for, for me. Like I wouldn't say it in those words, but that's the point I want to get to. This is what faith is. Biblical faith is trust. Based on reasons and evidence, it's not a pure leap. Now, and that's, that is the biblical word. If you look up and you did a study there, faith is active trust. That's what faith is. Faith isn't, I don't have any reason to believe it, I'm just going to step out and believe anyways, in spite of evidence or with no evidence. It's trust. We are trusting in God. We are trusting in Jesus. Period. Now, we have reasons. It could just be, this is the way I raise and I feel and this is what I believe is right. That's where my wife would be. I would be both. I've got some of those, but I also have evidence that I lean on. But we are not built on blind faith. Uh, we have active trust in God, and we have reasons for that. So don't, this is a Peter Bogosian, who is a famous atheist, trying to, he is trying to educate atheists to redefine faith with you or your kids and try to challenge them and say, well, your faith is a blind faith. It's not based on reasons, and so you shouldn't go that route. Don't let them redefine faith on you. Okay? Next one. What would you say to this? There's no evidence for God. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? I love it. This is Greg's favorite questions. And he does, if you've seen him before, he, he does the Columbo routine. Anybody, anybody know the Columbo? Um, where, uh, you're, you know, you're very smart. You're very intelligent. Do you mind if I ask you a question and, and then he just one more questions them to death? Oh, you know, that's very good. And he keeps at, and he's drawing them out. But it, Greg's first question is, what do you mean by that? You ask it, you ask it, you ask it. Eventually you get the question two is, how did you come to that conclusion? Why do you believe that? And then put the onus on them. Um, all right. This is an awesome response to this. And we don't think to ask this question. Somebody says there's no evidence for God. Our immediate thought is to say, oh, well, let me share some with you. And that might be fine. But you might also start with this question, well, well, tell me, what arguments have you considered? What evidence have you looked at? You know what kind of reaction you're very likely to get 99% of the time? A blank stare, right? Seriously, but a lot of atheists will say, there is no evidence for God. Oh, I, you know, um, that's interesting, because um, I've heard there is some, I think I have some, but tell me, what, what arguments have you considered? What evidence have you looked at that you found to be not persuasive? That's the stone in the shoe. That's the stone in the shoe. Now again, if they're open, they'll say, uh, well, do you have arguments for God? Do you have evidence for God? There's your opening. Okay? Um, the conversation continues. I haven't seen any arguments. Well, if you haven't seen arguments for God, then how do you know no such evidence exists? Um, there's no good evidence for God. Okay, I'm generally curious, which arguments have you considered and how have they failed? Um, all right, this is the last one we're going to do today, is they're going to redefine atheism. So some of the ways you can go about doing it is you say, okay, um, what do you think happens when you die? You know, uh, I think that we just, that we, our self is extinguished. Nothing. We become worm food, right? <laughs> Nothing happens. Okay, well, why do you believe that? So let's play this out a little bit for just a minute or so. Why do you believe it? Well, I, um, I don't have to give you reasons for atheism because I simply lack a belief. I simply don't believe God, so I don't have to give you reasons for why I'm an atheist. 
you believe something, so you have to give me reasons, but not me. How does that sit? Yeah. Don't be afraid. Now, if, again, I, I've, been, I've been through this a lot. I, I'm trying to, I'm probing. But don't feel uncomfortable. Say, you know what? This is interesting to me. Let me ask you questions. Just don't feel like, well, what's the right thing exactly I've got to say? Just, just play it up. Get, get them to keep talking. This is really interesting. And if you get stumbled on something, don't be afraid to say, you know what? Can I look that up and get back to you? Now, it's hard to do if you're on a plane, right? And you meet this person for like, you know, an hour. But uh, it's probably going to be somebody you know. Friends, family, or whatnot. And don't be afraid to say, you know what? That's a great question. Let me, can I come back to you on that? Oh, hold on. I got to look up Christian points. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, Okay, redefining atheism. This is a real thing, and it's a problem, and it's not true. So they might say, I don't have to give reasons for being an atheist. I merely lack a belief in God. Oh, the way you describe atheism confuses me. Can I ask you a question? All right, sure. What do you personally believe about the statement, God exists? So if I told you I th God exists, what do you personally believe about that statement? Well, I don't know for certain. I'm not asking what you know, I'm asking you what you believe. Okay, what are your convictions? What are your beliefs about this? I'm agnostic. Well, agnostics have no opinion one way or the other. From what you've said so far, though, it doesn't sound to me like you're neutral on God. An agnostic is I don't know, and they're neutral. But clearly, as you started to have some dialogue, this person is negative on God. So you're trying to flush that out a little bit. Let's keep going because there's a, there's a, a got, I got you, not, you know, we're not trying to got you with them, but we're trying to get to a certain point with them. Here's how you can put it. Given the statement, God exists, it seems like you've got one of three choices. You can affirm it, theism, you can deny it, atheism, or you can withhold judgment, agnostic. Those are really the three choices. Well, I have no belief in God. Isn't saying you have no belief in God different from you have no, no belief in God different from you have no belief about God? So they have, a, they have an opinion about God. Uh, I don't know what you mean. You think I'm mistaken, right? Right. So here's the point. If you think I'm wrong about God existing, then you must believe he doesn't exist, <coughs> which is why you have no belief in God. What you're trying to do is to get them to react to, does God exist? They're either going to say yes, no, or I don't know. And it's not about what they know, it's about what they believe. If they believe God does not exist, that's an atheist. Then I would ask them why. And don't let them fool you with this, well, I lack a belief, I don't have to share anything. If you lack a belief about God, that you have a position on God. Why is it you've chosen that position? That's what we're trying to draw them out. Just having this conversation with them, and I know this is a little, there's a lot here, but I'm going to send you these slides, is going to force them to think. Um, Greg Kokel tells something in the book, just having a question and asking somebody these questions, he had it with a waitress, and he was like, early morning, he's not a morning guy, just want my coffee, and then got into this conversation, back and forth a little bit like this, and then she came back to him and said, you know what, nobody has ever asked me questions like this before. And it started her thinking. So just trying to flush out what someone believes, that can be your stone in the shoe. Right? Okay, I think we're at time. Any final questions on this? This one's a, kind of a different one because it's a deflection on, like, what do we do when the atheists try to deflect? Next week we talk about the problem of evil. And then we get to morality. And these are powerful topics, A, for us to answer, and B, to make a point with atheists on why evil points towards God, or morality points towards God.